<laughs> okay. All right. Oops. Hold on. Let me just go to my view. Okay. All right, Joe, I'm ready. All right. We, we're doing the announcements here at the beginning instead of the end. Um, these are, we'll start with volunteering at Bellmead Park. This is the primary service day happens one Saturday each month, 9 a.m. to noon, and that is this coming Saturday, October 16th. Uh, this is the property around Bellmead Community Center and Oak Grove School that under the aegis of Bob Argebright has been transformed into gardens, paths, uh, and emphasizing the healthy stream that flows through there. And thanks to Daryl Downing, we have had a partnership with them for about four years now to go and volunteer and work there. Uh, next, we have two meetings of standing committees. Our advocacy committee, chaired by Lee Williams, meets on the Excuse third me. Thursday. I'm sorry to break in, Joe, but I want to make sure Siobhan saw the Catherine's in the waiting room. She was having technical ah. technical difficulties with her computer, so she's on her phone. Okay, I just admitted her. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> okay. All, All right. right. So I guess we'll all right. Finish the announcements or come back later. It's up to you, Joe. Well, first let's say welcome, Catherine. Glad you could join us. I understand you're on the unmute her her mic. Catherine, can you let's see, can you start your video? She's on the phone, I think. Oh, um, so yeah. Catherine, you you should be able to speak. You're not. We haven't muted you. We're showing as a showing her yeah. muted. She's showing muted on us on our view. Um, she wants to be muted from where she is, perhaps. Yeah, so she, uh, she has the ability to mute or unmute herself if you're calling on her. Well, why don't we finish the announcements <clears throat> since you started them, Joe, and, and then she, okay. she can then talk. All right. Uh, as I was saying, the, our advocacy committee meeting meets on the third Thursdays every month with Lee Williams as a chair. And that next meeting will be October 21st. Then the, our Skip the Plastics Committee, focusing, as the title suggests, on uh, discouraging and eliminating the use of single-use plastics, uh, meets monthly as well. And the next meeting is October 26th. The links and the connections are there. Uh, you see here our speaker for November, Katie Register, and her topic will be plastics. And that is on November 9th. And now to come back closer in time again, we have two outings. Uh, there is a hike this coming Sunday, starting at 1 p.m. Uh, on beginning on uh, Browns Island. There's a picture here of the new Emancipation Monument. Perhaps you had a chance to see it at the Folk Festival this past weekend. If you didn't, join us on Sunday and we are going to hike around the river trails of Richmond, a three mile hike beginning at 1 p.m. And then the second outing and uh, hike is on Saturday, October 30th. I think this uh, photograph should pique your interest this is in Petersburg on the Lower Appomattox River Trail, a four mile hike beginning at 9.30 a.m. 
and uh, afterwards there is an option for food and beverages in Petersburg. Those two heights uh, require a sign up and a brief, brief waiver, which basically amounts to you uh, naming an emergency contact. And I was also gonna throw this in at the end, but in case I forget, we have three weeks now we all have three weeks now to vote in any of the various forms that our lovely General Assembly has allowed for us in the last, uh, has instituted in the past couple of years. Please do remember to vote. That concludes the announcements. Okay. Well, I think um, we're ready for Catherine then. Um... Hello, Catherine. Hi, everyone. How are you doing? Sorry for all my technical difficulties. Um, just how it is. <laughs> yes, that's right. But you're with us. That's great. We see you and hear you. And that is marvelous. So uh, folks, just to give a brief introduction to our speaker this evening is Catherine Jordan. She has been on Richmond City Council since uh, the beginning of this year, elected last fall. Before that, she served on the PTA of Fox Elementary School, their Parks uh, and the Grounds Committee. She spent four years on the Green City Commission here in Richmond and has been the Fan District Association president. We are, for all her service over the years, but especially for making come true what might have seemed like a fairy tale a year ago at this time, which is the climate emergency resolution that was co-sponsored by every member of city council and passed last month. We are honoring Catherine with our Green Giant Award. And I'm <laughs> holding up. This is a virtual presentation. Oh, wow. Holding it's gorgeous. I love it. <laughs> You richly, richly deserve it. And thank you for being here with us tonight at our October meeting, Catherine. Um, we uh, look forward to hearing whatever you'd like to share about the emer climate emergency resolution, anything else going on in the city council. And after you speak, we'll have some question and answer time. Excellent. Well, again, thank you for having me here. And I'm really um, flattered and honored for this award. It means a lot. Um, but I share it with everyone who wrote, who called, who um, is no stranger to the fact that we're in a climate emergency. I certainly share it with my colleagues who signed on in unison. And to me, that was a huge thing. I wanted this to be the whole council because we need the whole council's buy-in if we're gonna make the progress that we outlined in that document. And for those of you who um, maybe are new to resolutions versus other types of legislation that come out of council, this is a non-binding document, um, but it's a powerful document because it has everyone's name on it, on city council, saying that they support these goals within it, that they acknowledge we're in a climate emergency and that there are actual steps the city has got to be taking together between council and administration. So, um, you know, there's never time to really celebrate when we have these victories because there's always the next thing we need to be working on. So if I can encourage this group to, and I know you guys are up to the challenge, you've already been working on the follow-ups um, and Lee Williams, I've, I've seen your emails and I'm, I love this direction. We need people taking the specific items out of that emergency resolution and continuing to hammer on them uh, with council and with the mayor's office and with everyone else. And um, so that is huge and I very much appreciate your collaboration on it. It's also gonna take a general raising of awareness. I think we've been very, this is such a bizarre thing to say, but lucky for all the stormwater issues people are having because it makes climate change real for people. Um, but we're not, we're not always have those headlines in the news making it real for our decision makers and for the public. So we gotta keep that education game going um, very much in the way that the heat island maps made it real for people in the city. They could see it, it was, too, it was right there on paper and it aligned with um, a really terrible and shameful history of how 
we um, segregated our city. So the more we make these connections that climate affects you, that's part of our past, that environmental justice is part of our future if we were gonna move forward together and make progress, um, is all part of, to me, the combined strategy for making the real change that's going to be, um, you know, <laughs> was necessary decades ago, but we've still got to keep fighting for it as hard as we can now in the moment. Um, so I'm flattered to be working on it on behalf of everyone here. And we've got some great partners. I think that's another part of the good news. We've got really strong partners who I think see the value of collaboration um, you know, from VCU students, uh, just across the board. It's been terrific getting to meet and know new people in this, um, new to me, not maybe new to the effort, but new to me in, in the fight for um, our climate and our planet. So um, I would say other things to keep track of beyond, um, you know, targeting the specific asks within the climate emergency would be every single budget cycle. Um, you guys did a great job of bringing forward climate in the ARPA discussion. And probably everyone got a thousand emails <laughs> to write city council, because I know I got those emails. But for those who maybe were out of town, ARPA was the $155 million um, COVID emergency package that the city um, is, is just creating a plan for right now in how to address what happened in COVID, how to try and better prepare our community going forward for future pandemics or emergencies. Um, and we did make some gains in that. Um, it's never gonna be everything we want, but I think we made some powerful gains in that package. But as soon as this one's adopted, which is probably October 25th, we're gonna have the next budget cycle, a cycle and on and on. So I would continue to encourage everyone to follow the budget process to um, it'd be getting to know your own city council members. Make sure you're developing relationships with them. You're showing up at their meetings. Um, you're writing into them. That really has an influence. And then I would also encourage people, um, you know, do what you can where you are. So for me, I'm on council right now and I'm doing as much as I possibly can on this as a topic. Um, but get involved in your neighborhood association. Get involved in your local transportation advocacy group. Um, GRTC board, they make big decisions. They, I think they're out on their last uh, board meeting or a recent one, uh, are doubling down on natural gas buses when, you know, we should really be pushing them to get off of that. So, uh, you know, there's always a door to knock on as, as this group well knows. And I encourage you just to keep doing it. Um, never, never get pessimistic because there are great people working on this and we are making progress. And it's, it's because of groups like yours. So I'm thrilled to be here today. And if you guys have any questions, happy to answer them or let you get on to the remainder of your program. Uh, feel free to put questions in the chat. And I, I know I talked really fast, so um, I just get very animated when we're talking about this topic. <laughs> so I will I'll well, try and slow down. This is, this is Glenn. Um, I, I, yes. I'd like to just, uh, if you could share with us, obviously the, uh, the resolution is very ambitious, uh, rightly so. But I know that you uh, are aware of certain priorities you'd like to see move forward first. And I think it would benefit uh, us in knowing what they are so that we can help you uh, get those over the finish line. Uh, we can't get it all done at once, but I know that you uh, um, strategically thought about this and have some thoughts with regard to where to go first. So if you could share that with us, that'd be much appreciated. Got it. Thank you. Um, so the two things that I think need to move forward first out of the resolution would be having the Office of Sustainability be an independent unit. Uh, right now it's in the Department of Public, no, um, it's DPU. So that's not the best location for the type of change that we need from within the city. So my first effort, and Sven and I have been working on this with the mayor's administration, is getting that moved to a more friendly portfolio so that the things that come out of RVA Green 2050, that office will be way better leveraged and resourced to make those uh, recommendations happen. Because we all know there are thousands of plans at every local government that sit on a shelf and don't get actualized. So um, 
for this group and for any allied groups to continue reaching out to city council saying, you know, thank you so much for passing it, the resolution. We're really looking forward to seeing that new independent office of sustainability. And I would, um, I will be in touch with you guys about when like the times to chime in on that are. And then you did a great job re reaching out to ARPA. Um, and we were able to get in, I would say, things that were not being considered. So the tree ordinance, updated tree ordinance, um, money for more trees, um, urban forester position, these are all things that the push from the public really helped get moving. The other big thing, which is our, our largest challenge by far, is to try and get the city moving away from our natural gas utility. And that was in the resolution. It was the boldest thing in there. Um, and there's a lot that has to happen between now and then. Um, but it's gotten on the radar of the, the natural gas lobby, for sure. Um, and it's also, you know, we've had questions from Russian tours, like, does this mean I'm gonna have to shut down my kitchen? Like, I, you know, I've had a really, really hard last 18 months. How am I gonna transition off natural gas in my kitchen? I realize it's the right thing to do, but does this mean that, is this imminent? So we know that people realize, I think people understand that this is, um, that we can't achieve our climate goals if we have a, a utility, but we need to keep educating council members elected officials that natural gas has been sold as this positive alternative that it's not. We need to keep reinforcing the dangers of natural gas, um, the negative effects on our climate, and in highlighting the cities that are transitioning away. Um, you know, probably the low-hanging fruit, the first things that will happen will be limiting new connections to residences. Um, but we also have to think about how we transition our employees at the city to those newer green jobs. So. I think to the extent that we can position this as how can Richmond become energy independent? Um, how can Richmond move towards renewable energy, be a leader? Um, and I think that's something that's really important to remember. It's super easy to get negative about the climate emergency, but people want positive stories. Um, they wanna feel like they can do something that they can actually you know, achieve, <laughs> achieve something positive um, in the face of sort of overwhelming odds. So, you know, the story needs to be Richmond being a leader on this issue um, and not waiting for the market to make it, it more expensive than it already is to try and transition. So um, I would love to see, you know, our partner groups here having a conference on this, inviting partners from other you know, cities and to talk about it and really trying to make it, um, just as people are talking about heat islands nonstop now, can we be talking about renewable energy and that natural gas is not what we need to be using right now, how to get off of natural gas. Um, so that would be. This is Carol, I just had a question. Hi, can sure. you tell us, hi, can you tell us or, or share some examples about how other cities have made this transition and how long it's taken them to do it? Well, I, so that is what I really need help from our expert groups, but the things that I have seen happen are, you know, writing the code, you know, no new natural gas hookups for, you know, residential projects and things like that. So um, I think I see Jessica Sims chatting in. Do you have some resources on that? I know we've got some experts in a specific topic. And the great thing about this resolution for those who weren't aware, it was written by the advocacy groups. Um, so people were bringing things that they saw in other group, you know, other parts of the country. And this wasn't just me in, in my horrible city hall office trying to create this thing. This is coming from best practices across the nation. So um, that's not a very fulsome answer, um, but that's the next step is how do we do it? What are other municipalities doing? I might add that nobody's really done this yet. Uh, a, number of, or a number of cities have actually made a commitment to it. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, Oakland, California and others, uh, but you don't just flip the switch and go off of gas. They start moving down the process like, uh, not allowing any new hookups. For example, entire uh, UK, United Kingdom, has basically banned new gas heating facilities, boilers, residential boilers, after 2025. So everyone's going to have to use a heat pump after 2025. Now, that doesn't mean you have to get rid of your boiler. Um, it means that uh, if you have a new system, 
is going to be a heat pump. Um, so, so there's ways to phase this in uh, with minimal expense. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I guess I would just say, uh, Councilman, Councilwoman Jordan, um, uh, if you want us to take this on first, we're happy to do it, but this is one of the bigger lifts. And uh, I know things like heat island effect and freeze are probably a little bit easier and at the same time, not that easy. So um, uh, let us know where you want us to put our emphasis first, um, because uh, uh, as you say, there, there'll be a tremendous amount of uh, industry opposition whipping up concern from restaurateurs and uh, other folks. Um, I mean, for example, you know, we could basically say, and I don't exactly know what's in public housing, but as the county, as the city builds new public housing, it should be heat pumps. It shouldn't be gas furnaces. It shouldn't be gas stoves because that's not healthy to breathe combustion products. So there's different things they can do uh, without uh, raising the alarm as we start to move down the path, because I think we'll see reinforcement from the federal level, uh, maybe, <laughs> or the state level uh, as we go forward. So we just want to get moving down the path. Thank you. Yes, exactly. And chipping away where we can. And I think your idea of, you know, the things that are within the state's control is, you know, spot on. Um, you know, to that point, we are pouring over a quarter of all of our resources from the ARPA money into these new community centers. So what are we doing there? How can we make them not just lead? So I think lead minimum is what they're touting as being the green effect for it. That's not enough. Like if we are putting that amount of money, these should be resiliency centers. Um, you know, we should have solar power. We, we, this is a, a location that we could treat um, stormwater. There are all kinds of things that we want to make sure that as these things start to be built with input from the community, that we are reminding them that they have they could be um, serving a whole nother ho um, host of purposes beyond just a facility for programming mm -hmm. and with our in with our housing for sure when it comes to like what are our energy sources. Catherine, we have a question from Lee Williams mm -hmm. in the chat and then a question from Ken Shaw after that. Okay, um, I, so I have misplaced my glasses. If someone wants to read sure. the um, questions. From Lee? Can you elaborate on the timeline you envision for the initiatives? Um, that's something we need to work on together. We've been really focused on trying to get ARPA through. So um, I, I do not have a timeline right now. That's, it's always been sort of my thought as I approach this that we're doing this together. Like, what is our timeline? That's something we need to work collaboratively to figure out. Um, and I need to gauge where you know, my colleagues are on this in the city. So, um, no, the things that I have more specific timelines on would be Office of Sustainability. That should be within the next budget. That's something that should get moved in within the next budget. Um, and then the things that can be funded with ARPA, I mean, that'll be now through 2026, um, that they will, those dollars will be spent. Um, and then every, you know, the budget's like a cyclical thing. Um, and we'll be able to give you guys like talking points when the budgets are being developed of you know, what, what we think is most advantageous for you guys to push for um, and, you know, colleagues to work with on those specific topics as they develop. Um, so ARPA, someone had a question about ARPA. ARPA is the American Rescue Plan Act, and those are the federal dollars. The city received $155 million. And the mayor's proposal for it was introduced Monday night. And you can find more information at rva.gov forge slash ARP. There's money for affordable housing. There's money for a health equity fund. There is, um, I think it's now 19 point something for climate weatherization. Um, and then I think it was $88 million or $66 million uh, for community centers and parks. Great. Thank Next. You have a question from Ken and then a question in the chat from Ralph Grove. Ken, over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks. I, um, I have a, uh, a, a very specific question, but it's applicable to a lot of brick uh, apartment houses in the fan. Okay. Uh, it's a three, it's a three story, six unit building I bought in 1976 with a black roof, no ceiling insulation. <laughs> uh, 
and a big old oil boiler burning 4,500 gallons a year, uh, heat and hot water. It's been converted to a highly insulated attic, a silver roof, uh, storm windows, um, and, a, and the heating system is converted to a highly efficient uh, Munchkin uh, uh, boiler uh, for heat and hot water. I also have a solar hot water system on it. Now, my specific question is I am ready to upgrade. I'm glad to hear about weatherization uh, funds, of course, um, how that works exactly, we'll see. Um, but I would like to insulate that building on the outside with uh, foam and plaster. When I inquired about this a number of years ago, I was told that uh, that becomes a siding system and would require a building permit. Uh, the problem being that the uh, actual property boundaries are from uh, brick corner to brick corner. Um, so I assume I could get a special exemption to put, oh, two to four inches of foam on the outside of that. There are alleys on both sides, so uh, it really doesn't uh, have any practical effect. One is a city alley and one is a private alley. Um, so is there a way that we can facilitate putting exterior insulation on brick buildings without unnecessary paperwork? Gosh, I do not know the answer to that's that. A, that's um, a, that's a, not a direct <laughs> question for you to answer now, of course, but yeah. it's something that if you could work on that, that I think is a real issue. Mm -hmm. um, and along with that, I would I like to put mini split heat pumps in, of course. Um, we have the electrical capacity to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, getting that exterior R5 brick wall insulated for uh, year round benefit would be a huge, uh, uh, a huge benefit. I also have the option to um, put a greenhouse on the front of it. It's facing southwest. It's up by Bird Park, um, the end of Rosewood. Um, so it, the whole building could be solarized very uh, nicely. Uh, mm -hmm. But having, uh, maybe this would be a good uh, uh, example case with the building department, and we could uh, find a way to modify those rules as far as uh, property boundaries. Yeah, so Andreas Addison, who's in the first district on city council, mm -hmm. is also keenly interested in these types of things. So he okay. wants to work on an omnibus package of a number of different, um, you know, legislative pieces related to um, green industries and issues like this. So uh, I feel very lucky to be coming into council right now with some allies already um, on council. So. Um, Sven will put his email um, in the chat if you want to send him those thoughts. And then it sounds okay. like you are, um, I'm are a, you in the fifth uh, district. I'm a, yeah, uh, okay. I'm a retired solar contract, semi retired, uh, mostly retired uh, solar mm -hmm. contractor and energy contractor. So I worked with the V Hero program back in the 90s. Uh, I have a lot of experience on energy conservation. So I've got all sorts of ideas to improve the building efficiency and awesome. reduce the gas usage. The last time I checked, uh, my son pretty well manages the building for me now. He's in down in Randolph. Um, but the last time I checked, we were about $3,000 a year for natural gas. Um, and we're just using window unit air conditioners. So uh, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a multifaceted uh, project that would probably be very applicable to an awful lot of buildings in the fan. Yes, and uh, the price of natural gas is going up. So yeah, I, I just sent you that probably just got a bill. to my son the other day. Yeah, really. so it's either 10 or 15% yeah. increase and the city is required with the way that the utility is set up to directly pass those increased costs onto customers. Yeah, so I'm aware of that. yeah, so, you know, I think that's another thing working in our favor. Um, you know, natural gas shouldn't be cheap. Yeah, and I agree. as much as it hurts. It, it, yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, a hundred percent. See both sides but, of that, but. Mm -hmm. 
uh, it's been a good run with natural gas. I uh, I stopped burning a lot of oil uh, very early on and uh, don't burn any oil now. Uh, mm -hmm. Excuse me, we better move on to other questions. We have a lot of other questions. Okay. To get to. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you for that question. Next one is from Ralph Grove. What's happening with transportation improvements, including public transportation, new inner city rail service, and EV charge? Okay, so I don't think we're going to see um, light rail in Richmond. That is a very expensive project. Um, I, I tried to get money back into ARPA for GRTC. Um, it didn't make it in, so I would continue every time you comment about the budget, make sure you're saying we want more alternative, more dollars for alternative transportation. Um, you know, phase two of the e-bikes, there are lots of things the city could be doing. When it comes to EV infrastructure, um, that is one that our city, sorry, our office has been working on. And I don't know if Sven wants to, this is maybe an opportunity for me to introduce Sven Philipson, our second district liaison. Um, but then also on plan RVA, I just want to make a pitch for that. Um, if this group isn't following that, closely, please do. Smart scale grants are gonna be opening up soon. And they've never talked about EV infrastructure, which is like mind blowing to me if you're talking about regional transportation. Um, and that's something I'm trying to add to the agenda for the next meeting. But Sven, can you um, give an update to the group on where we are with that? So we have had some yeah. meetings. Yeah, so first of all, good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for having us and apologies for impersonating Catherine at the uh, top of the program there. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I don't shine a candle to what Catherine's doing on council, but I'm really glad to be working with her and working with you all um, uh, in this in this work on the climate emergency resolution. Um, so as far as the EV charging infrastructure citywide, um, Catherine referenced um, Andreas Addison in one paper that he carried earlier this year was a broadband infrastructure master plan study uh, that he wanted to undertake so that we were prepared for federal dollars, state dollars, future initiatives to be able to expand broadband access across the city. What we've been working on uh, with stakeholders and administration is doing the same thing with electric charging. So really putting the resources in now so that we gain a more comprehensive understanding um, citywide for where our unmet need is, uh, how we can model out demand over the years, um, and how we can address um, expanding EV charging infrastructure at all levels. So that's, you know, congregant uh, where you where you may be able to charge at publicly available stations. That's permitting for folks to be able to um, effectuate EV charging um, adjacent to their home uh, for their for their cars and otherwise. Um, so sort of all levels. And um, that's something that we've been partnering with uh, Councillor Addison on uh, and his office is also quite excited about. And uh, we are working on trying to secure some of the, the funding um, and, you know, staff capacity necessary to make that uh, planning process uh, happen, commensurate with our, you know, next budget cycle uh, and with hopefully some federal dollars coming down soon from the infrastructure bill. Yeah, and then when it comes to EVs within the city, uh, we recently did a tour of the Richmond Ambulance Authority, and I don't know if people are familiar with with their project, but in 2016, the fleet manager who was just looking to solve a problem, he was looking to solve the problem that the batteries on the ambulances were not lasting as long as they would like, and they were burning a lot of fuel idling. So they installed solar panels at the Richmond Ambulance Authority on Hermitage, and that is how the ambulance batteries are charged up. Um, and it's been really successful. And I love telling that story because I get pushed back all the time when I bring up Green Fleet because our largest fleet purchases are for public safety. And I'm told, well, we don't want to, you know, public safety, you really don't want to take a risk with, you know, with, you know, anything like that. You, just, you know, that would take a lot of studies when in fact, we're trusting our ambulances right now um, to solar powered batteries. So um, there are a lot of success stories out there and I'm trying to push the city harder on that. And I had tried to get some money in ARPA for it, but we're hopeful that there might be money in the infrastructure package. Um, but yeah, I hope that helps answer a little bit. We have another question from the chat from Sarah. Where on the list of priorities is expanding the replacement of streetlights with LEDs? Um, and Sarah so, goes on to share uh, how impactful that change can be. 
Yes, absolutely. And the city is um, transitioning and there is money in the ARPA budget to continue that transition. And I don't know, Sven, if you have a more concrete timeline or update on that, but we were told that that is absolutely something that the city is doing and it's it's just they're not going to do the whole city at once. Yeah, and I just dropped an article in the chat that details some of the current initiatives that the city is undertaking. Um, and to Catherine's point, I think there was a um, million dollars in ARPA for lighting improvements in the city. And, um, you know, we would hope to be able to uh, leverage some of those resources towards uh, LED retrofitting as well. I don't see any further questions in the chat that weren't addressed directly in the chat. Um, if anyone else has a verbal comment or a question. This is Glenn. Um, you touched on the forestry issue earlier, and I know that you uh, included the, an Office of Urban Forestry in the uh, resolution. Um, do you see that as a priority, or at least your priority, for the next budget cycle? Yes, definitely. It has so much. Um, momentum behind it. You know, people are really on fire for trees right now. And I think, you know, where there's already alignment and support, we want to push that through. So yes. I had a question, um, Catherine. Is there on the table uh, funds, do you think, from ARPA to help businesses and homeowners make the transition from natural gas to electricity? There is not right now. Now, I'm not sure what's gonna come down the infrastructure package, but I think when we get to those large transition points, we wanna be incentivizing our, our customers, right? Whether they're homeowners or businesses. And, um, you know, in Obama's package, I worked on the neighborhood energy retrofit program. And, and that was part of it. It was trying to help people make that transition to weatherize their home more, um, and switch over. So we need to get to that point. And that'll be, that would be part of the conversation I would be bringing when we get to that stage, because it's, it's going to be hard and it needs to be an equitable transition. Right. And there's not everyone who's going to be able to afford to do that. I think there's a, a sense of panic when people start hearing this information. <laughs> it's like, you know, well, what does that mean? Are they going to cut my natural gas off? How much money is it going to cost me? I can't pay the bills that I do have. So yeah, right. I think there's a, going to be a big PR issue there. A hundred percent. And I think that's why we need to really work on the education before we work on any transition plans, because otherwise it's, it's, you know, there'll be hours and hours and hours of people lined up to speak against it at city council and we won't get there. Exactly. But at least the idea is getting socialized, right? I mean, this is what the resolution was about is, Someone's got to start saying the change has to happen. Some things we can achieve more quickly. Others are a lot harder, but if you don't start to put it out there, we're, we're just not going to get there. Agreed. I saw a question from earlier in the chat from Andrew Peacock, who asked, does the city have any plans to extend the network of electric car charging stations? Sven, did you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, yeah. So, Joe, to to the earlier question that I think that we had on EV charging infrastructure, um, you know, there's very limited access um, right now across the city, and not really, it's not really um, oriented as a publicly accessible, you know, utility and 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 um, resource for folks. And so, um, part of the sort of EV readiness master planning that we're looking at taking on with uh, Councilman Addison. Um, would be to, to look at where we can strategically uh, deploy, whether that be city owned EV charging infrastructure, where we can help facilitate the permitting and placement of uh, private EV charging infrastructure and, and again, the residential um, approach as well. And I will add, I mean, we're seeing developers add that in. So, um, you know, the market is catching up on this topic. We also have some large, you know, redevelopment projects coming online, the Diamond District, which, um, you know, that RFP I think was just released. Um, there's opportunity to be building this into city projects, but we're seeing more and more that the private, um, you know, commercial side is, is bringing it in as well, which is great. I 
I see a question in the chat, but I just can't read it. It's having to do with traffic flow. That's a direct message. Okay, I apologize for squinting. Is there any plan to convert the time traffic lights to censored lights? I hate sitting at any traffic light unnecessarily. We could eliminate idling and unnecessary exhaust. Okay, so the timing of the traffic lights is something that our office has not delved into, although it has come up um, in some specific areas. So I know when, with some of the ARPA money that we got, they were talking about lights, traffic lights, and we will see how far we're stretching these ARPA dollars when it comes to transitioning lights um, and uh, the other things they're asking for. But that is like a low hanging fruit to try and get folks to stop idling. And it drives me crazy when I see city cars idling. So that's been something I've wanted to bring up along with the RPS buses. Um, we should not have any city owned vehicles idling. Uh, when you see police vehicles idling in the ambulances, um, that has been because they need to keep, the battery would die if they turned off the engine and they need, there's a, a, just so much more electrical um, components to those vehicles than what we remember as, you know, when we were younger, like they're just very heavy battery drains on those vehicles, which is why they idle, which is why they should, um, you know, be solar recharged. Let's take one more question. Anybody like to venture a final question for the evening? Um, well, maybe I will. Uh, Catherine, you talked about the ambulances and we just talked about idling. How does the, but how does the uh, general picture look for progress to the, to an electric vehicle fleet? Wow, I have been pushing really hard on that. And if you fo follow the last budget cycle, I held up the budget process because um, I didn't want them buying any new vehicles if they weren't going to commit to a green fleet. And we were supposed to get a green fleet update. It was supposed to be last month. I think it's going to be this month. But the city did commission a group to come up with a plan and a strategy. And it was robust. It was a really good plan. Um, and unfortunately, it, I feel like it sits in a department that not, is not necessarily as excited about implementing it as they should be. So I'm going to continue pushing on it. Um, I'm going to invite Dan Fowler, who's the fleet manager from the Ambulance Authority, to talk about it to council. Um, it's a big priority for me. And Hopefully there'll be money in the infrastructure package. If not, I believe we're probably gonna have a surplus um, that we'll find out about shortly. And then we have the next budget cycle. So that'll be something I continue to lobby for and we'll reach out and ask for your assistance and making sure my council colleagues support it as well. Thank you very much. I think that's my dog is all, is all for it. She was uh, chiming in <laughs> that yes, she wants to be <laughs> if they don't support it, we'll sick pebbles on them. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine and Sven, for joining us tonight. Uh, Sven has been putting fantastic amounts of information in the chat, uh, a way to sign up for the newsletter, a way to reach them via email. Uh, Catherine Jordan, our second district representative on city council, we really appreciate you being with us tonight. Well, thank you so much. And again, I appreciate um, the award, but what I really appreciate is the dedication that your membership has to making sure city is moving in the right direction. And we will get there together. Um, you know, I never claim to be an expert on any of these topics, but I am gonna be your champion on council. So let's continue working together for our common goals. Thank you. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. I'm gonna go do some um, middle school algebra. So wish me luck. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Good night. Fantastic. A rare treat to get to ask questions to a city council person. And now we have another special feature of this meeting tonight. Uh, Catherine Jordan mentioned in passing VCU students. And last year, some VCU students taught by Barry O'Keefe did some magnificent artwork 
illustrating issues that the Falls of James group is working on. And Sarah Davenport is a relatively new member who is here with us tonight. She has come onto the scene with amazing energy for the project of turning these artworks into a source of funding for the Falls of James group and for getting them out to be seen by the public on t-shirts or tote bags or water bottles. To make this happen, one step is we're gonna ask you tonight to give us your opinions on which of the art, which of the images you think will are the best. And uh, so we have a video online technological survey for you now and take it away, Sarah. Thank you, Joe. Um, as Joe mentioned, yes, I'm helping to organize the uh, a fundraiser for the Falls of the James Group grants program. Uh, in previous years, this program was funded by an in-person fundraiser, but since we have all been living through a pandemic that has not <laughs> been able to happen. Um, so we're organizing a virtual fundraiser. So November 1st through December 31st of this year, we will have an online store uh, that will sell reusable products with these designs on them. So not only will the store raise funds for the grants program, um, but it will also hopefully be raising awareness for environmental and climate policies that the Falls of the James Group is advocating for. Um, so we do have a survey that I'm gonna share with all of you today, and we wanna hear from you what kind of products you would be interested in buying. Um, so we have t-shirts, totes, water bottles. If there is something else, please do let us know. Um, and then also to please vote for your favorite designs. Uh, we're gonna choose three to five uh, in total. So uh, I know it's hard to pick because they did create a lot of really amazing designs. Um, if you haven't seen them already, you're about to be impressed. Uh, so this link here will be, I'll separate it out. Um, what I did share with you just now is my contact information if you are interested in getting involved. Uh, and then also a link to the Sierra Club grants program. Um, if you're not familiar with it in the past, you can go to that link, see uh, grant past grantees. Um, and then separately, I included the link down below for the survey. Uh, and then all of the products are RAP certified that we would be selling. So if you want to look a little bit deeper into understanding what RAP certification is um, and the ethic standards that they have. So we'll take a little bit of time together to fill out the survey. It takes about five minutes. So I'm setting the timer and hopefully we'll all be done. And then I'll, I'll show the results to everybody here. If you're not seeing the survey, just take a quick look and see if scrolling down to the bottom of the page, if you see a next button on the first page, there's just a description. What page are we talking about? I don't understand. Yeah, so this link here, um, I'll resend it again in the chat. Well, there's two links. There's which one? The um, one that says HTTPS 
colon forward slash forward slash forms, um, the one that says forms in it. Sarah, I'm just not seeing the survey. I'm just getting a link to the grants programs, but I'm not seeing a survey. Okay, let me, I'll just resend the link in the chat and then tell me if you still have issues finding the survey. If you scroll down to the bottom, you have to hit next because the first page is text, okay? So you see the actual survey after the first page. Are you saying to go to the second page of the chat or the second page of the grant page? If you click on the link that I just posted in the chat, that will that should take you to the survey page. The first oh, page gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. has information. I'm there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank okay, you. Great. Yeah, no problem. Sarah? Some yes. of us, wait a minute, some of us have taken the survey that was sent online. You don't want us to take it again, do you? Uh, if you've already taken the survey, you don't have to take it again. We're holding a separate one uh, right now. We'll combine everything in the end, but right now we just are curious to see um, what our fellow Falls of the James group folk uh, think and then, uh, but if you have taken the public survey, then no need to. I thought that the answer. artwork was wonderful. It was really good. Yeah, yeah, they did such an amazing mm. job. It's really beautiful. If I might make a point here, uh, I guess by way of lobbying, uh, although it's completely your decision, because we have a plastics bag campaign that we're rolling out to phase out plastic bags. Uh, obviously, the plastic bag uh, uh, artwork, which is based on the city seal, uh, could be on totes. So I'll just make that observation because hopefully uh, people will be buying totes and using them for their groceries, et cetera. And it would be nice to reinforce that message. So just my point of personal privilege with regard to that uh, conservation tie-in with the art. All right, Does, has everybody had a chance to submit? Are we still? Mm -hmm. Okay, yep, yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, so um, Jessica, if you will make me the host, uh, then I can share my screen with everybody and we can look at the results together. Uh, you should be. Oh, okay, great. Well, that makes it even easier. There we go, sorry, internet is a little bit slow. So it looks like uh, t-shirts in terms of the actual product are, are leading here. Um, I do see grocery bags as one, which luckily totes will fit at least some groceries. Um, art prints, I agree, I would love to see some posters in the future, but it looks like t-shirts are leading with totes slightly behind. And then uh, to skip over some of these more uh, minor details in terms of which design for which product, um, it looks like we have protect the streams 
uh, design is leading, which is definitely one of the top five in the public survey as well. Um, divest from Mountain Valley Pipeline, which I don't believe is in the top five so far for the public survey. So if that is something that you really wanna advocate for and you do know that there are plenty of other people uh, who would want to purchase products with those designs on it, then by all means advocate, share the survey um, and let people provide their feedback and vote for their favorite designs. Um, embrace the night as beautiful and make Richmond wildlife friendly. Those look like some pretty strong leaders. Um, and plastic free is close behind, it's close <laughs> for Glenn out there. Um, so again, we'll be hosting this fundraiser uh, November 1st through December, 30, December 31st. Uh, we will choose the winning designs by Friday of this week so that we can continue to announce, engage, you know, let people know that this fundraiser is happening. Um, and please do follow the Pulse of the James Group on social media if you are not already. Um, many of you are already members, um, but if not, you can sign up to become a member. And we'll be sharing stories of what the past grantees have done uh, during our fundraising campaign so you can see what people have actually done with this money um, and how it has impacted the local communities throughout Central Virginia. So that is all for today. Thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's so great to see those instantaneous results in a graph. Love it. Right. Thanks Google, very much. Google has a lot of <laughs> tools, yes. <laughs> Well, we are so lucky to have Sarah and thank you so much because I, you know, we used that we used to have the big yard sale. This will probably be the third year that we won't, you know, be having it. And uh, this is just an amazing, she just kind of came in at the right time at the right place and <laughs> jumped in and just took over. And it's just been amazing. Thank you again, Sarah, for all your work. Well, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. And if anybody's interested on being the, you know, helping with the fundraising team, um, you know, let us know we're we're meeting on uh, Friday. We have a small group of people that are involved in the team. So if you're interested, let let us know. Thank you very much, Sarah. That's right. And of course, these uh, the aim is that these products be ready for sale just in time for the holiday season and for gift giving and gift buying, which would be delightful. Um, we, uh, there is one other uh, announcement topic here tonight before we close, and I would like to uh, call on our executive committee member, Aileen Rivera, to discuss something that is uh, going on with the DEQ, Department of Environmental Quality, that is. Yeah, thanks, Joe, and uh, everyone. Um, we have information, and actually, we came to some information from um, DEQ that Henrico County has been repeatedly violating state water control laws and um, dumping. Um, that we we have the reports, and I'm actually going to include it here on the chat. Uh, and, and my apologies, I'm trying to get it to work. And um, we uh, we found out about it yesterday. Um, tomorrow, we have only till tomorrow to comment and uh, um, to com comment to the DEQ to press pressure them to make um, Henrauka County um, take action on um, this illegal dumping. Um, it's residential and industrial waste. Um, I'm sure, um, if we, anybody is interested, I, I am gonna send the email, um, the information here on the chat and I'll put the link of the report. Um, for some reason, my computer is just, I don't know what it's doing, but let's see if that works. Um, and uh, if you can please email and request that DEQ um, enforces the law that makes Henrico County um, follow the laws and they're due tomorrow by five o'clock. And I'm gonna send the rest for some reason, it wouldn't take any more of the, of the information. So I'm gonna send the rest of the information here. Um, again, if um, 
if you can please email, we're asking for individual emails and it, it doesn't matter. You don't have to be from Henrico County um, to um, email um, the, uh, the DEQ. And it's doing that again. Sorry about that, you guys. I'm hoping that it's coming through. Um, and, um, but that, that's all, um, you, can, you can take a look at the report if I can get it to, um, to go in. <laughs> um, let's see. I don't know why it's cutting it out. I've got okay. the link. You got it? Yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, if, please, please, if uh, just a quick, um, um, email to DQ just asking that they enforce, that they follow through, enforce the law to make Henrico County um, do or take action on what they're supposed to do in the in the report. It states everything that they're supposed to be doing, and they have not. Um, so that's it. Thank you, Aileen and Jess. Uh, so everything is going as usual, just exactly perfect. And uh, thank you for bringing us, you know, this is something we only have till tomorrow to make a comment on. So we ask if you have time, please do so. And thanks for joining us tonight. We will send out uh, a follow-up email with the announcements in it. Uh, so you can remind yourself about those, the hikes, the committee meetings we have coming up. And uh, please join us again on Tuesday, November 9th for our next meeting, Katie Register on Plastics Pollution in Virginia. And uh, thank you, Jess. Well, now thanks to our Zoom account. Thank you to Jess for helping us to set that up. And uh, <laughs> to Siobhan, for helping to host, for Sarah for creating and bringing us that survey. And I hope you all have a good evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for everything. Take care.